This is a shithole and we all should be embarrassed by leaving here. That's a shame. I used to live in Brixton and I never smelt as many drugs as I smell here. <laughs> That's a shame. Smaller projects don't um, really get noticed by the council. That it's still in the bottom 10% nationally. And that's, um, that's a shame. Okay, so my name's Oswin Nasser, and this is Tongue Tide, Burlington's community podcast channel platform network. And today we're here to discuss what I've come to know as the article from last week in the Yorkshire Post. And here we have so a panel of people. We've tried to be quite a cross-section of demographics in the town, but you know, we're limited with you know, COVID restrictions as well as time to try and get this sorted out. And I think we've done a pretty good job. You know, we've got three women, three guys, you know, as well as myself. And you know, I, I represent some diversity here as well, so that's good. <laughs> and we're going to hear people's opinions, and we're going to have a frank discussion about the article and where people you know, find they interpret the article. Is it negative, positive, where they want to... Is it bad? Is it the worst piece of journalism, uh, worst piece of journalism ever, as I've been told? Um, or is it some things in the article that even if it might be too negative, needs to be addressed and needs to be recognised? So I'm going to pass this microphone around and let people introduce themselves. So, Cess, if you'd like to begin. Hello, I'm Cess Lindley and I run Dridlington Neighbourhood Watch. Up here, <laughs> yes. I'm Cess Lindley. I live in the centre of the town and I run Bridlington Neighbourhood Watch, coordinating the councillors, not the councillors, coordinating the coordinators. Right, thank you. If you want to pass it on to Johnson. Uh, hi, yeah, my name's Johnson Walker. Um, I work as a host of, uh, on the Tongue Tide podcast with my good man Osman here. I generally have an opinion on just about anything, so... <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda Holderness. I um, work at White Rose Lodge Care Home on the seafront, and I moved to Bridlington in 2016, five years ago. I will, thank you. I'm Andy Walker. Um, I'm the elected councillor for Brid South, where we are now. Hi, I'm Sasha Walker-Allen. I moved to Bridlington just over three years ago from London. Um, I'm a self-employed potter, but I also work at Morton Art Gallery and at White's Bakehouse in Bridlington. Thank you. I'm Alex Verda, and I uh, run a recording studio and record label in Bridlington's Old Town and help out with putting on music around the town. Nice one. Oh. Yeah, nice one, guys. That's brilliant. Excellent. Everyone's introduced. So I'd like to start with just my involvement with the article, and I'm sure you know both me and Andy kind of... Do, are we responsible for this article in some way? I suppose well, we are. we spoke to a journalist. <laughs> what we did was speak to a journalist, wasn't it? Uh, neither of us wrote the article, and neither of us instigated it, but we both contributed. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I'll start with my involvement with the article, so we'll just give some context as to how it happened and you know, paint a picture of what it was. So I'd bumped into... Andy in White's, not meeting him, just you know, crossing paths, and he was chatting to a young man called Joe Gerard, who happened to be working for the whole Daily Mail. And I believe you were doing an article already, you had invited him to the town. How did that actually happen? Uh, he invited me. Uh, right, okay. He said, um, I want to do an article on deprivation. Right. Uh, I've looked at the maps, I can see Bridlington's had some history in there. So, would you meet me for a cup of coffee? So, yeah, let's go to White's. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so I bumped into you and you said, introduce me after I was walking out. And I started by basically having a go at this young man uh, about certain, because as soon as I found out he was working for the Hull Daily Mail, I thought, okay, I need to have a word with you because some of your articles at the Hull Daily Mail have been really, really, really poor in your reporting and instigating, I think, hate and division. And I know the police have had issues with them. So basically the first few moments of me talking to this young man was me just attacking him. <laughs> But in a good way, in a nice way. You know what I'm like. Um, so in a nice way. So anyway, I think you'd run out for time, didn't you, on that meeting? So you had to go somewhere else. And this young man wanted to go around Tennyson Avenue and the skate park and some of the places that you wanted to highlight. So I walked him around and we spoke about things. And, you know, a lot of the things in the article that you've all read were mentioned and spoke about. Like, not just by myself, but other people we encountered. Did you mention what was in the article? I know, this is it. I was going to do I talk about the article because... Or just give a rough outline. Rough outline? Yeah. 
the rough outline is this is a shithole and we all should be embarrassed by leaving here kind of thing and it's all deprived and we've got loads of issues. I think that's sometimes how people see the article. I personally, after reading it, I don't think it's too bad myself, but I'd like to think people have read, everyone here has read the article, haven't they? Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, okay, like John said, paint the picture of the article. It's a, it's a negative article. It doesn't paint Brillington in the best of lights. It talks about gangland violence. It talks about drugs, uh, drug gangs, which I don't know too much about, if I'm honest, in terms of the gang nature of it all. Um, and it also talks about you know, as you, as you mentioned, Andy, about how there's not much careers or jobs or aspirations for young people in the town, how a lot of the businesses have moved elsewhere. Um, so going back to Joe Gerard, walking around, you know, doing this, going to the skate park and everything, and he seemed like a very clued in young man. And look at the article, and I know people have had the, you know, some people don't like the article. I think it's actually not too bad, but I want to hear what you guys have to think. I want to hear what you have to say and how you interpret, because it's your town. So, who wants to take... I think, you know, Andy, you've had a lot of flack this, this, this week, I've heard, from council I've heard. So, what's that been like for you? And I, is there certain things in the article that you feel would like to take back or readdress or has been painted in a negative <laughs> way? Perfect, absolutely yeah, perfect. <laughs> that's some good timing. But an elected person getting some flack really shouldn't be a surprise, should it? Uh, but... Yeah, but the, the bit that I think irritates me most is that councillors know that uh, we didn't write the article. Uh, I was happy to contribute to it because I like to discuss Bridlington. I was born here. I lived on Tennyson Avenue for more than a dozen years. So I know the area and I love it. But it's been in the deprivation register for years, not just two or three, but for decades and if the council is going to criticise anything, they should be criticising the fact that it's still in the bottom 10% nationally. And that's, um, that's a shame. It's shame on them. And I don't like uh, the, the common move. You, I'd be interested to know if it's your perception as well. Good news gets published all the time. And if all you ever hear is good news, the town's got this, we're opening that, we're doing all these things, there's a whole raft of people who don't have those same opportunities. And the good news passes them by and segregates them away. And they need a voice. And that's why I'll, I'll, ha I'll happily discuss uh, deprivation, uh, the side issues from there of uh, drug misuse, domestic abuse that goes with it, all, all the nastiness is there. And it just, I know it isn't the only story. There have been literally hundreds of good news stories. Good, that's great, love the town. But there needs to be a little bit of balance so we don't completely forget the people who don't take their hospital appointment because they're, they don't have 25 quid for the taxi ride back from Scarborough because the services aren't in Brid anymore. It's the side issues of deprivation that sadden me greatly and those are what I wanted to talk about. So that's my, it, it isn't how the article came out, <laughs> but hey, I'm not a journalist. It's just the way it is. I think you made lots of pertinent points. I know that it upset a lot of people um, because... Oh, just a bit close to you. Um, because it was one-sided, it was reported just on one angle. Um, there is lots and lots we love about Bridlington. I've been here 25 years and I'd never go anywhere else. Um, but I've worked um, on West Hill and I set up a community centre up there. Uh, I worked there for 14 years and spent a lot of time applying for grants. So I had to know all about the statistics and what areas of deprivation we were in and we are in the bottom three um wow. and i was quite shocked i, I didn't realize that um we've got the, the the three estates there are lots of problems there but living in the town when i first started up the 
uh, community centre, I was living there um, at West Hill. Um, and then we came back into the town. And for the first time, I had time, I'd retired. Um, I, I, I wasn't retired when we first came down here. Um, the last seven years I was working, we were still here. And for the first time when I retired, I could see out of my front window all this drug dealing, the problems that I'd not noticed before because I'd been too busy working. Um, it was a, quite a shock that it was so open. Um, and eventually I, I got involved with Neighbourhood Watch and felt that it, there wasn't any coordination and started Bridlington Neighbourhood Watch as a separate charity just to get the coordinators together so we could get together with the police and councillors. You've been to one of our yeah, meetings, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, it's walking the path between the middle, really. I think it's desperately important that these things are, are attended to. And also it's important to keep the name of the town up right. and to, you know, promote the good things. Uh, the other side of the coin, um, there was a, an article written by somebody else who, you know, went to great lengths to talk about all the good things at Bridlington. We talk about so the Guardian. Guardian article, yeah. Was it? Yeah. 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 No, not that one. Oh, right. That was like um, a tourist guide somehow. Well, it's, it wasn't a tourist guide, well, it, was, it was like a, an editorial piece on, like... It's like know, promoting the town, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? It was a promotional kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about a, a, another long article. I saw it on Facebook. Was it the Brid Echo or was it the... No, it was a personal one. Oh, right, OK. Sorry, yeah. I'll, I'll show it. And it was, um, and it was very pertinent pointing out all the good things that have been done and that are still going on. Um, uh, and so we've got two separate sides. And I think it's important that we move those together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, that, sorry, I was just going to say, let's get some initial responses from everyone else, because I want to touch upon exactly what you're saying about, OK, we've got this article that's on the face value is quite negative. But we want to, you know, we always have to look at the positives. But let's, uh, if we want to start with you, Johnson, let's, uh, yeah, you can try and get so everyone's initial in person. Uh, I, I was, I was born in Bridlington. I lived here till I was about twenty, and then lived in Liverpool for about twelve years. And <clears throat> excuse me, some of the things that were written and how they read in the article mm. about drug gangs and stuff. There are no drug gangs in Bridlington. There are drug dealers, there are drug users, but there are no drug gangs. There's no like trafficking of heroin, cocaine. It's not being trafficked through the town. I don't believe that for a second. This, it's being dealt, it's not being trafficked. It's not, there's no people coming off the planes and moving through. There's no one getting shot in the street. There's no cordons off of people being stabbed, being killed. It's not organised crime in the way that organised crime is usually defined by what it is. It's desperate people doing desperate things because they're desperate. Personally, I'm of the, um, I'm of the opinion that drugs are more of a symptom of deprivation mm -hmm. as much as they are a cause of it. And it's sort of it's like a snake eating its own tail. It feeds into itself. But I think a lot of the positive things about the town the people that are suffering the deprivation, they won't necessarily think of particularly positive things. It's like it's a seasonal town. There's not an awful lot of opportunity for people all year round. And I think that feeds into, you know, there's no, it's difficult to, like, for example, I worked in, I do work in finance. So if people that can't get mortgages, so they're stuck in a renting cycle. And it's more, for what I pay for my mortgage, I, it would, you know, it would barely pay a third of what a rent on the house for, on the same street would be. And I think there's uh, the improve, what needs to improve with the town is there needs to be more of a focus towards the people that live here all year round, less on the people that have moved here to retire, mm. because, you know, it's like from my own experience from work where people would, you know, they quite, they would sell a house in Leeds for three times what it costs to buy a house here and move to an estate on the outskirts of town. These issues don't bother them. Mm. And yet they're some of the most vocal people that are out there. And just to touch back on the Guardian article, I can't help but think, but with the Yorkshire Post article, it's really, really strange to have such, you have a Guardian article saying how good Bridlington is and the Yorkshire Post article coming on the same day. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like I have friends like uh, that have visited the, from London, from Liverpool that come across and it's like, oh, I see Brit in the paper today, like cause, with me, the Guardian. And then literally half an hour later, so laughing emojis. Oh, and you made the Yorkshire Post. <laughs> Do you know? And I think 
I, I think was it, quite proud of that moment that we yeah, can have yeah, those yeah, two. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's something the bridge good at. But you know, as, you know it's like we do the podcast together. We get people and we get people's experiences. And I'm not disregarding anyone's experience of how they feel because mm. if those people have been spoken to on the street and that's how they, that's what their experience is, then that's what their experience is. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you know, it's, 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 it's a subjective thing. It's how they feel. But I do think there is not a lot culturally here for, for, for the people that do live here all year round. Um, for the younger people, there's not there's nothing for them to do. Do you know, and that's where you, you cycle of drugs use and misuse and the dep- a lot of it comes from. You know, things are improving. There's like the work Alex is doing with some of the music gig, uh, gigs that are like really inclusive in the upper mic nights that uh, Jamie Hayward, who, if he were here, would be talking about as well. And things are sort of changing for the better. There's a community hub. But it's a slow process. And as Andy was saying earlier, if Bridlington's been in the deprivation list for, for decades, you know, it's like um, a lot used to get pointed to the centralisation of the government towards Beverly, and that was a turning point. And then as soon as that sort of happened, that's where, and you can see in the developments that have happened in Beverly since, compared to what's happened in, I think it's Liverpool, in Bridlington, um, there's, you know, it's, there's a disparity. Um, but I think... With the article, I think you've got to. It is some of what he's saying. Pro, it probably is right what we're saying, and it is a deprived area. But and there are good parts. But I don't think it's as sensationalist as it is. I don't believe you know. There's no um, you know where dr- the drug violence like this. You know, I can't remember the last time someone. Oh, thankfully, someone was murdered for a few years. And usually, if there is like orchestrated gang violence then that's a sort of regular sadly it's a regular issue and in somewhere like where I said where I used to live in Liverpool there's you get so used to it there was one time I was walking home from my job I'd finished at 10 o'clock and I'd walked home and there's a pub where someone had been shot out so I did make the front page to be fair and it was all cordoned off by the police and I looked at it and I didn't even think for the poor guy that had been shot I was like oh man I'm going to have to walk the long way home <laughs> You just get so, and then it's like when I've, I've lived here since but I moved back in 2013, and like the idea of if I was walking with the kids and having to explain what the little tent is that um, where the scene to, if I had to explain that to my 10 year old daughter, I'm not sure I'd be able to, but I think exactly. I've said enough. To no, that's <laughs> really, really yeah, good points. Um, let's put it across to Sasha if that's okay, yeah. and we'll work it back and forth. Um, yeah, it's really interesting hearing everyone's opinions on it. I think the the main issue for me regarding the article in, in the Yorkshire Post was um, the fact that, not, not the points it was making necessarily, because I absolutely agree about the deprivation. Mm. I am one of those people who sold up in London and moved to Bridlington because I was able to afford to buy something outright in Bridlington that was twice the size of the place that I had a huge mortgage on in London. And I know I was only able to do that because this is a deprived area and there was a very small area in the northeast of England that I could have afforded to do that in and Bridlington was one of those places. Um, But I live right in the centre. I I wanted to be in the town. Um, And my personal experience is that there is obviously a huge amount of drug use in the area because I used to live in Brixton and I never smelt as many drugs in all of my 20 plus years in Brixton, as I smell here. Really, right. I mean, it's not that it wasn't there, but it, I smell it all the time here. And I walked through Queen's Park the other day at quarter past nine in the morning, and I'm walking right through the middle of the park, so I'm not even close to someone's house, and the smell was overwhelming, and mm. I smell that all the time. But I've not experienced any violence. I don't feel scared to walk round Bridlington if it's dark. Um, And I felt the article kind of undermined itself. So although it made some really salient points about deprivation, about and and I absolutely feel for people who live in these uh, multi-tenancy houses that may have been overrun now by drug users, drug dealers, and they are trapped inside this property that they can't get out of. That's awful. And I absolutely accept that that goes on around here. But I felt the article undermined itself by being sensationalist, as you say, by really targeting itself at a Daily Mail reader, by talking about the skate park and implying that the skate park had somehow become scary because it was now graffitied. I mean, anyone who doesn't understand that skating and graffiti are part of the same culture shouldn't be writing 
an article in a newspaper, in my opinion, because to me, that then read like, well, you don't actually know what you're talking about, you're just saying really bad things about Bridlington. And it just was inter very interesting timing as well that the Guardian article came out and the two articles were so polemic. And I know they were from a completely different point of view. The Guardian article is one person who was either born in Hull or lived in Hull for a long time, who came back to Bridlington for the first time in a long time, had a fabulous couple of days. And he wrote it in that style, and that's how you should understand it. It was his personal experience, but it was brilliant. He raved about it. And then you've got this other article that basically says, no one should go to Bridlington. <laughs> it's not a safe place to go to. <clears throat> Don't ever consider living there. Right. And if you are considering living there, don't buy property on Tennyson Avenue. Which I thought, you know, anyone currently trying to sell property on Tennyson Avenue, <laughs> that's really very unfair. Um, so I, I just, I, as I say, I feel like there were salient points in the article, but it all got undermined by the tone of the article and by bringing in these additional things that were completely irrelevant. Yeah, no, I can, can I just... You come from London, welcome. Uh, I've lived on Wellington Road for about 13 years um, and I've had new neighbours, two from um, London, I've Scotland, York, um, you know, and it goes on down Wellington Road and three of those have moved out and gone back. This is what bothers me, the good people that are coming in and enriching the town are becoming so we wary, not wary, weary um, of the constants, because I can see it all outside my window. Um, the police do the best, but it's... And when you say there's no gangs involved, there's county lines that have been waiting for them in the, in the station. That was something, um, you know, that the police did for a while. And we see the young children coming from places like Bradford. It, it is very real. It's no worse than other towns. Right. Um, we're not, you know, the uh, den of iniquity in comparison to other places. It's the same in Scarborough. But if we don't talk about it and don't address it and its effects, then it will just continue. So we mustn't flatten what's good about Bridlington um, to, uh, you know, not deal with the, the drug issue. No, absolutely. And it, it's not just drugs, it's the landlords as well. Um, rogue landlords, I call them. They buy a property, they stick people in, they don't maintain it. Um, they, uh, the building becomes decrepit. The uh, tenants are in and out, so they don't feel a sense of place. They don't look after the property either. Um, and so that can bring a whole street down. Um, Amanda, you live on North Street, is that right? Yeah. Uh, is your experience the same on this? Yeah, um, because I live on North Street, which is, it's very close to the town, and the surrounding roads in that area is terrible for drug dealing. I see it every day, nearly. It's young men in tracksuits, they're hanging around on street corners, or they're pulling up in car parks, and you can see them passing through the windows in in plain sight, in daylight. And I just think, why is this happening? Why is nothing seemingly being done about it? Right, so, your, so on the article, what was your impression of the article? Were you... Yeah, um, I thought that, I, like everyone said, you know, I agree with points that you've made. The article probably has a lot of truth to it. Um, and it was very negative, but... It just doesn't provide any solutions. Yeah, I think that's definitely is, what we which all Which is the agree, annoying there's no, thing. Yeah. There's nothing helpful in there. It's, it's not giving any suggestions as to what can be done. And I think the trouble is, young people now in Bridlington, if they are born in Bridlington, they're possibly born to families that are involved in the drug dealing and, and the... the well, I, I know that there's a big generalisation, but what I'm saying is on these streets where you see the drug dealing and you see that... Um, people are maybe low-income families. Um, they may not have that extra support that they need. So then, because there's nothing really for children 
or I don't think there is in Bridlington, where they get that extra help and they can steer away from the drugs. They just end up, it just ends up carrying on like a vicious cycle. Where do you think the help should come from? Sorry? Where, where do you think the help would come from? Like, uh, give the microphone. Where, where do you think the help would come, should come from? Do you think it should come down from government? I, I, I mean, I do, I do. We walked down Tennyson Avenue just last night, just to see, as a bit of research today, just to see how, how threatened or frightened we Just to see if we, we got were. stabbed. Is that did, we, did we feel threatened or frightened? Threatened no, we didn't. Threatened. But yeah, I appreciate there's a lot of this maybe goes behind closed doors. Or yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, sorry, just get back. Do you think the effort should come from the government? Do you think people should have more support when they're born into the low income? I mean, I don't, I, I agree. Do you think that's something? Well, from the council, probably. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm just going to, unless there's anything else that you want to say, Amanda, at all, I just want to try and get if everyone's yeah. opinions first on this article and uh, how they see it. So, yeah, Alex, oh, you're, you're the youngest of us all yeah, here, I, I assume. I got <laughs> called in this morning. I'd heard about the article, but I only just read it this morning because you kind of got me. <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's kind of fresh in my head. What really kind of struck me about oh, it is... Uh, close oh, to you. sorry, apologies. Uh, what's what... <laughs> no, like, what, what really um, struck me was, well, like, it brought up real problems. It was all, like, it was very toxically put. It was almost like there's a level of shame attached to the right, fact okay, we are this way. Yeah. And it was, make, it was saying it like other places don't have the drug issues that we do. And I know there are, there are places that are far worse. Like, if, if, you, if you go to Driffield, it's actually worse there. Um, not to bring Driffield down, but... Um, <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's, that's like a... With actually that point, what I just did, I've noticed people do that to Bridlington as well, from like like from Scarborough or like. Oh, from possibly. Driffield. I grew up in Driffield. It was the yeah. whole Springfield Shelbyville thing, you know. Yeah. Bridlington was Shelbyville, and we all to shit on. Yeah. Bridlington so like this, time. and but like an article like this kind of brings that, like it gives that more fuel. Yeah. So like, oh yeah, look at all this bad stuff about Brid, and it's not good for any development here. And like people could see this article, and just it just fuels negativity about the town. So we're not going to grow with that negativity. How does it make you feel as a young person reading an article like that? Um, it, it's, just, it's just concerning. Like, if I, I want to read and I want to look at like, bad things. I, like, I want to know what's wrong with something so yeah. I can like, maybe do my part in, in fixing it. But at the same time, it's kind of like... It, it, it does knock on. Like, when I went to school in Driffield from Brid, mm. it was just like, oh, like the Brid kid's here now. And there was always yeah. that like, stigma against it, at first anyway, before everyone kind of grew up a bit. But like for the first two years, it was there was always a bit of that involved, and like the people coming from Brid schools were, or coming from Brid on the bus was kind of like there was a bit of distance put between us before we got like co- no, like I properly understand. integrated. That's exactly my experience growing up as well. In fact, I think if I remember one joke was you know what's the difference between ste- stepping on dog shit in Driffield and dog shit in Brillington? You know it's dog shit in Driffield. <laughs> that was one of the things yeah. that they used to say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I know that there's that. Thing between yeah. <laughs> Brinton and, and but yeah so you've heard this article as a young person do, I mean do, do you are you worried concerned do you feel like oh no I want to get out of here now and um, it's all uh, going me, me not particularly because I'm kind of committed to helping it out yeah. in like whatever way like by doing like the music gigs like, like since I've been doing since about 2017 I've been mm. trying to get gigs on and there's never any support because in Brid like everything's pretty much focused creatively and like musically on the spa so right, like smaller okay. smaller projects don't um, really get noticed by the council, and there's no like support with them. And I could have if there was like a bit of kind of funding to help people do this kind of thing, I would have had like a lot more success rather than having to like slowly buy equipment myself and like putting these gigs on. Right. Okay, that's an interesting point. And that... like, um, what was it? The spa. This is a bit different. To, actually, no, I don't think this is on. This is relevant. So I'll stop there. <laughs> no, no, carry on. I don't. Uh, oh I'm no, I was just complaining about like ticket touting at the spa, and they don't have any like. Um, opportunities for like local bands to come on like there's no, not? There's, no there's never been any like open other than battle of the bands which is like for schools but there's never like local band night which could like brid doesn't have we have bands but they're not that prominent but we, we used to but the, the scene died so, yeah yeah, yeah we used to i think that was another one of the big things that, that cost Bridlington is the leisure center when it was built it's just like it used to have the the theatre next to it and as a teenager when I was growing up like there was there was the uh, they'd have the dance nights on they'd have an under 16s disco and then once a month they'd have a rock night and it was just like it was somewhere everywhere could, anyone could go and I don't think there's, there really is that anymore and I think that's um, yeah 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 <laughs> I'm sorry yeah I'm, I'm going to stand yeah, yeah. we need more mics yeah. next time we'll have more mics yeah yeah but like um, 
I never got, uh, ended up going to any of these because I didn't know it was happening at the time. I wasn't really into music, but there was a, a, a music night which kind of brought people from like every different type of, like every genre, and they'd just come and sing at a night, and it was like just a safe space for people to then actually be creative. And we kind of have that on Sunday again now, mm. but it's not as inclusive as what I heard Shades was like, because Shades got closed down. But no, Did you ever go down to one of them? Oh, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's something we're going to touch upon in a moment is like, okay, back in the youth and where, like we say, about positivity. Um, if I could just take that back, back for me, I don't even know why I'm taking it, but is there any other points that people want to raise after hearing what other people have said or you disagreed with or you want to, like... Can I just put one point? Yeah, you can. Um, it's like you say, it's getting places to do these things. And I found with the community centre, I mean, it was quite small for what we did. We had a big yard at the back and we just a shop front and a little office behind. And we used to have to beg, steal and borrow to get spaces to do things. Right. Uh, we ran 13 different projects all at the same so time. So this is at the community centre that was on Victoria Road, is that right? No, Where West Hill. West Hill, right. Yes. Is that still there then? No, no, it's closed. Right. Um, money. And I retired. And it's those two things together. And it, it is the money. It's getting somewhere. Like the hangout has had to close. Um, because they couldn't, they, they couldn't keep enough money going uh, to keep it, the hangout going during the, um, yeah. So I was going to say, so what are there? I mean, you said the hangout, the community centre, well, West Hill. What spaces are there for, say, someone like... Well, the, there's the Young People's Club, um, that? and that's on um, Gypsy Road. Right, okay, we're talking um, the boxing club. Uh, yes, that's what they used to call it, the yeah, boxing. Yeah. It's now the Young People's Club. The Young People's Club, right. right. Okay. But they have to pay. Whoever goes in has to pay. Nothing's free. And we always found that when we wanted to put on venues, we, we had to go for grants to pay for them. And it was this continuous, um, you know, beg, steal or borrow to try and get somewhere for the children to be rather than it being an organised central thing that you had these spaces all the way around the town. Well, yeah, and this is my point, is like we talk about the Regeneration Programme and what's happening on the seafront, but as everyone else has kind of picked up and addressed or aware of, what's the point of all that if we can't have something for the young people here that are growing up? Yeah. It's all well having a lovely seafront, but if we don't even have... You know, I didn't even know the hangout closed, but I know there were mm. like lots of clubs were struggling throughout this lockdown. Yeah. I, I, we are failing then, aren't we? The young, if we're not got those clubs. Well, it's a it's a a collection of incidents. You used to get church halls, all youth club, in many many centuries ago mm. when I went to a youth club. Um, it was always a church hall, and you paid threepence or something like that. I mean that. <laughs> That's really giving it away. Um, Sorry, Johnson was just... Uh, Sorry, just, just, I'd just like to... Do you think the problem, the failure with a lot of these clubs, it's not the young people themselves that are running them? So it's like what the people's idea of be, what would... It, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 40s. I'm not Sorry, just probably, repeat that. So, what you so the, the, I think one of the big failings of a lot of why these things don't take off like they do is because they're not actually entrusted to the people that are, they're actually for. So right. it's like you, you've got... it's. It's like if I was to run a night for a 17 year olds, like I'm 40, I don't even know what they're into. I mean, to be fair, I'd probably ask Alex and just <laughs> get him to do it, claim all the credit, but um, it's been done before. Yeah. But I think a lot of the, the feelings of it is, it's like if you were to get a church hall now and say, you know, I mean, there's Ollie obviously in Christchurch who's doing a wonderful job, but if you were to get something like a church hall like now, I don't, I don't really think that's the sort of venue that would really appeal to people to go. You know, it's like, you know. employ youth workers. And their young people uh, to be there, and you see, when you try to get these venues, it's too expensive because they have to pay insurance, have to pay heating, and councils don't have that direct money from the government anymore. So councils are short of money. It's it's all about this money thing, and also the town isn't as rich as it was when I first came with Sarah Lee, the big factory, mm -hmm. and the larder factory. And, and the other one on Bessing Bay. Bridgeport. Uh, and Brit Brit that's Bay. it. Uh, um, so there, well. there was some real um, secure, at the time, um, places for people to earn good money. And that's all gone. Mm. 
Um, the, yeah. Shall I pass it Yeah, no. Yeah. Sorry, don't go on, don't you? Yeah, well, I'll just have a quick go at that, please, because, yeah, uh, I'd really like to try and focus, though, on the deprivation issues. Mm. I, I know the article said a great deal about drugs, and, and there really are some very severe class A drug problems in Brid, and, and I won't have them swept under the carpet. Okay. Uh, the local police are doing what they can do, yeah. but you're right, it's about money. Mm. And exactly what Johnson said is correct. These, uh, there are initiatives around. There was the Bridlington Early Intervention Team uh, down near my now Hildethorpe way but their funding was cut and they had some terrific successes at intervening in families that were deeply troubled mm. and these took real specialists and terrific courage to do not every case was a success but where you win one you win it for a whole generation was was the issue but you're right it's about funding and for me that comes down to priorities when the budgets are set and you've got places like Bridlington South and Witherensea as well. These are bright red on the map and they're there for decades. And I've asked them time and time again, why don't you set a simple target to lift the worst wards out of deprivation and don't set any other horizon scanning or blue sky thinking, just take the national stats and Make it your business to invest, to get those wards raised. It, it's not a poor county, is it? East Riding of Yorkshire is not poor. No. You're right, the funding's been cut. All Everybody's short of money, and you now need magic phrases like a good bid for a funding stream. And if you don't have the right language, the Hinge Centre, by the way, they do such terrific work mm -hmm. because they have a team of people who know how to find money. Mm. They're really, really talented at it. And it's that sort of thing where the landscape's changed. The money doesn't automatically filter down. And that also brings you to the music venues as well that used to be there. Um, Brid Spa, uh, I have a lot of time for. Uh, I was part of a small band that played in Manfred Mann when they came and that sort of thing. Everybody in the 60s was, was in a band. It was just the law, you had to be. But they did allow the local bands to play in the big bands. They played in The Who, they played in Martha and the Vandellas and Roy Orbison and all the lot. But those opportunities just don't seem to be there anymore. I also really liked the idea of venues or occasions being handed or directed by the people most affected by them rather than somebody like me who's got a jolly good idea for this you know, you're much better at it than we were and you should own it and people should have um, not just the wisdom but the courage to hand it over that if your decisions are being made locally in your street they're going to be better for you than if they were Beverly or Westminster or wherever. So the more that that can be done, the more that people can be educated about the, ne the need for funding streams and finding the money. Uh, I see there are some music venues uh, and appointments being made. Is it at Black Lion? Oh, Black Lion. That's coming up again, isn't yeah, it? It's I'm just I'm getting going. Sound, yeah, I'm doing the sound on the 20th and then once a month afterwards. I haven't actually, uh, still haven't been there yet. So, but yeah, uh, Black Line started up, and it's like it's got a stage that you'd expect to see, like in a city. Like it's it's probably the biggest thing we've had, um, and it's really positive there. The venue uh, still seem to be a bit slow because they seem like normal pub owners who have got this huge stage and they want to use it, so they don't really know what to do yet. So they're getting me to do sound, which is probably going. I've got big speakers, but they might not be big enough for that space. So I'm just going to have to like. Fill, fill the gap for them but them doing that and kind of coming in they haven't really got in contact with local bands yet they've kind of got a very set image of what they want to to do but that's why i need to actually go and talk to them myself but i've been like uh quite focused on other stuff at the moment like trying to get some other little things started back up after lockdown but it's, oh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, on my list it's uh, james williams who's going to be doing them at, at first so like, i'm just the sound bloke but yeah um yeah 
Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, so, sorry, uh, Andy, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, nobody's just the sound bloke. It's absolutely pivotal. That's what it is. Um, yeah, so what are the positive, because I think we're, I don't know how we're doing for time. What time are we on, guys? Does anyone know? It's 10 to 8. 10 to 8. Well, yeah, we've gone through that. That's great. Let's quickly get some things about positivity. Amanda, I know you've not spoken too much on the but In terms of, we've got this article, talk about deprivation. We all agree, yeah, okay, it's a bit too, you know, it doesn't offer any solutions, I think, as you said. Yeah. What do you think? What would you like to see? I just kind of want to go on something that you were just saying just then about um, having venues and things. And like, have you ever been to Spotlight Theatre? I have been to Spotlight. I love Spotlight. Because I, I'm... I think it's amazing, and <laughs> me and Sasha were like part of Spotlight, so <laughs> it's a huge plug because I could yeah, talk let's about talk it all Spotlight, day. Because I think it definitely needs a mention, um, doesn't but it? It's, it's 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 a community theatre, and that you know it's not about money. We're a charity, and we try and get as many things in as we can. You know, we push for time and space quite often, but it would be great to have young people come in, even if it's doing a band night or. You know, a comedy evening, just something that young people will be interested in. I mean, we've done a number of drives for Spotlight to try and get young people involved, and we really struggle, and we particularly struggle on the tech side. So we've got lots of people who are happy to get up on stage and sing and dance and do whatever. Mm. Um, we've got some strong musicians. We could always use more musicians. Um, anyone who gets involved, it's purely voluntary from everybody's point of view. No one gets paid. But it is an incredible little theatre. If you've not seen it, come and have a, a tour of it because you won't have seen anything like this theatre in a small town that is run independently. I mean, it's, you know, the, the history of the society is they used to rehearse in church halls and they'd put stuff on at the spa and then eventually they bought this old printing mill and they've turned it into this lovely 84 seat theatre um, and we're desperate to get young people involved and we're desperate to get people who are tech based involved because we never have enough people in the sound box do we so that you know no, great what kind of other specific roles you know because hopefully people see this uh, you know yeah, put an I mean, advert out you know I mean anything that you are interested in from a theatrical point of view whether it's performance whether it's tech, lighting, sound, whether you're a musician, whether you want to just volunteer to be front of house, all of our front of house people are, are volunteers. Um, and you know, a lot of them may not come back because after the pandemic, I mean, a lot of our volunteers were sort of in their 70s um, and you know, they've been hit obviously hard by the pandemic and they're a bit nervous mm. about getting back out and dealing with people. So we're looking for people for all roles in the theatre, really, aren't we? And, yeah. um, and, and, and anyone who wants to do funding applications as well, <laughs> that also would be great, because we obviously have to apply for funding a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, anything, really. Well, I think I should touch on the, like, as you mentioned, about the Hinge are very good with their funding applications. And I've definitely something that I've uh, recognised now trying to do funding now applications myself and it is a skill you know you have those certain buzzwords but at the same time when you get good at it you can just knock them out can't you and you just send them out yeah, to different organizations <laughs> well they are but i mean in terms of like okay you, you reckon okay just 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 not as a knock them out, just send them out just send them out just try and get as much out as possible in terms of uh, no, what you have to do is to read what the, that funder Sorry, yeah. uh, wants to fund and what their, their criteria is. Mm. So you've got to get to know each funder and then you've to direct it to them. And this just doing one sheet of paper to send around to everybody, it goes in the bin. Uh, and it didn't work so like that. I was successful that. the first time, so I was actually okay. With it. All right, well, you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you were lucky. Well, no, no. no it, was, it was only because the organisation we were dealing with actually was picked out by the person I was trying to get funded for, specifically for those reasons. It's just yeah. hard work. Well, this yeah. is it. And I'm it's, not it's a lot of effort, yeah. but it's well worth it. Like the hinge, we got the um, lottery, mm. and that, I think, is coming towards... I think it's next year, mm. coming towards that end. But the big thing about the hinge, because I used to be chair of the hinge... Oh, did you really? ..when it first... We brought it to Riglington from mm. Goole, um, and I always said that... Uh, I mean, at one time, down Gypsy Road, they used to have fires. Uh, the 
pinch cars and race them up and down Gypsy Road and then set them on fire. Sounds like fun. I mean, <laughs> and, and they called it the Gypsy Road Estate, so they then changed it to Havenfield. And a lot of money went into getting something together mm. for that. And they got um, one of the empty houses and made it into like a little hub. Um, and that's when we came in right. then and uh, brought the hinge from Goal. Um, but the big thing that made the change was that we started taking on social work students and training at the Hinge, and they actually so That's interesting, because you're engaging the younger, you're engaging the younger generation, which is yeah. very important. Sorry, Johnson, yeah. you wanted to... Yeah. Uh, yeah, so just to talk about the good things, yeah, the spotlight face is boss. I've seen you there, I recognise <laughs> you now. But um, I think this thing... I, what I would like to see promoted as is usually when something like in London, like when, um, oh gosh, what's dust and, and all those places came up. It was because of rent, the, the, the down, with the advantage of it being sort of deprived, was prices were low. So it's something you could actually appeal to creatives to get it because it's, it could be in a working from home sort of way, it could be a really good place to live and have property, live Absolutely. by the sea. Because your overheads would be so much less than if you were in, you know. That's actually what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, they, this is actually what is happening. People have worked from home all through the pandemic, and they're making huge changes now. They don't want to live in inner cities anymore. They want to come out to the coast. There was a big article about Scarborough just the other day about you know how many people are moving to Scarborough. Um, it wasn't made by the same guy that did the Oxford Post article. I don't think so. <laughs> it may have been. Um, but, you know, as I was reading that, I was like, well, Brid Bridlington is exactly the same situation. You know, if you could get people to think about it in those same terms, to think about, you know, there are a lot of artists and arts-based people in Bridlington. Absolutely. There's a um, great community and, and culture. If, here, if you could get together. some sort of collective together, whether it's, I mean, I, I keep looking at that building that's just to the side of the railway station. Yes. And if you could turn that into an yeah, if you could turn that into an artist collective, that would be fabulous. You could have all sorts of artists in there doing all okay. sorts of different so kinds of work. You get the funding applications for that one sorted, and we'll go. <laughs> but the problem with funding applications is yeah. that obviously you're only ever funded for six months, a year, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So to then retain the talent that you might attract, no one's got security. You can't, if you're only working on a one year contract, you can't apply for a mortgage. Mm -hmm. You can't settle somewhere. And it, it just becomes this cycle then of, I'm getting towards the end of my contract. Mm -hmm. I've now got to apply for funding again. I don't know if in three months time, I'll be working in this yeah, job yeah. because and it may not be funded any longer. Think for so, the future then. So then you? you go, well, actually, I'm going to apply for this job over yeah. here that's, going to, that's a permanent job, and I'm going to leave this area even though I don't want to. Yeah. yeah. That's the crap yeah. you don't want in your creative life, isn't yes. it? That, yeah. That's the exact opposite yeah. to a creative space for your head to really bring out the best. But you're right, there are loads of places. Uh, Rope Walk always struck me as a place for live work over the workshops. Mm. That's what it, it looks like a bohemian quarter as well. It, it could be with a few, uh, yeah. The goods shed at the station, it will come to the market next year. Um, it's currently leased back to Network Rail. Uh, I had a look at that. I tried to rent it for the gymnastics club but the ceiling isn't oh, wow. high enough, and they can't get a 13-metre square floor in it. So, But it's a great, great building, and, and it actually looks the part as well, yes. doesn't it? Yeah. It's spot on. And you've got all the footfall of people coming in and out of the station. So if you've got an artist collective in there, and, uh, and whatever arts it is that, you know, if you then have an outlet to sell some of those arts, you've got footfall all the time through the train station. That's what it was to begin with. Uh, the old parcels office. Sorry, um, no, 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 that's different. Yeah. The parcels office is different. Yes. Oh, we're talking at which parcel office where mind is at right now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for that to go on to that. But what I'm saying is the old parcels office started off um, really in a, an empty warehouse. Um, and I can't remember the woman who used to run it, and she got a lottery grant, and that's what. And, and all the artists were in there. In fact, Rosie still um, teaches art classes in there. Um, and what we don't tap into enough is U3A. 
University of the Third Age. What's, so, yeah, tell us what U3A is for anyone who doesn't right. know what U3A is. Right, U3A is for people say, I mean, they say there's no age limit, but it's normally people say 50 upwards. And we've got so many people come to Ridlington, they're retired, uh, but they've retired from jobs where they're teachers, they're um, all sorts of professions. Uh, and they want to enjoy the retirement. We don't have people retiring now to sit in front of the telly. Um, and they have 80 odd different groups. And the Is it true that Brillington has one of the largest U3A groups in like the country? Has the largest? The one of the largest U3A? Yeah, yeah. Do they have lighting engineers? Well, they might do. But this is it, and that's then, a very good point. It's like, look at all these people got talent. If you go on U3A uh, website, it tells you all the different groups, where they meet, and you don't actually pay for anything, only the venue, you all chip in. If it's going to cost a tenner, uh, then you all pay your bit in for how many people are there. Um, how, about if, how about if you made a rule that uh, if you were bringing your professional skills, you had to bring an apprentice mm -hmm. every time? Just turn up with an apprentice, and now you're the no, lighting engineer. It wouldn't work that way. Um, it, <laughs> People offer, like Rosie, um, offers her uh, expertise free. Um, everybody just pays a pound towards the venue. And what I used to pay £30 a session for up at West Hill, she puts out for free. Um, there's a lot of talent out there that could be used. Well, this is it. There's lots of talent out there. And this is what I've recognised in the last year, you know, the, Brillington is one of those places where a lot of people have to come to look after their parents or brothers or whatever, or they've retired, and they have to leave their careers prematurely sometimes. Mm. And there's mm. loads and loads of talent. I mean, the guy over there, that's one person. I mean, this guy's... <laughs> 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 he's bought all this equipment here, Jason, and he, you know, he's, he's worked as a cameraman, he's been to LA, he's, I'm really jealous of the guy. Lots of talent, lots of capability. And I know the same with Johnson, I know the same with Sasha, you know? I'm sure it's the same with you guys as well. But you know what I mean? I don't even get me started with this guy. He's a legend to me. Because <laughs> he's, he used to work with uh, uh, Rareware, with the Stamper Brothers. And I'm a big Nintendo fan. So there's lots of talent here. But it's about getting that talent and saying, OK, we need to show, especially if we've got a youth or a generation of youth who don't have decent role models or, you know, opportunities to learn these things. I mean, this guy's, look at the equipment he's got there. This is proper top grade stuff. Mm. If we can get people like that to pass on those you know, that experience to younger people, which is exactly what Johnson, I, 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 what we're talk, trying to do with this podcast, with people like Alex. And I think, can we use U3A and get young people in there so that they can be taught and, you know, encouraged with some of these talents? Well, approach the U3A. They have a meeting every month. Um, you can be, are you going to come with me? You can... Yes, I will take you, I shall hold your hand you can hold my and hand. introduce I need, I need you. My hand yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they have a speaker on most, uh, most months, right, okay. um, so you can apply, uh, get in contact. I think Sue Gallup still runs it. Right, I'll have to get those details uh, yeah. after this. Um, I think we're running quite short of time and I'm going to, like, if you, don't, you guys don't mind, we'll wind it up a little bit here, but... Um, Closing thoughts for myself, and everyone else is going to have a chance to have their closing thoughts. Um, I love Brillington. I love this place. I love the I love the rough and ready element to it. And I love the I love the fact that you've got people living cheek and jar from different backgrounds and different places in the country. I've got nothing but optimism for the future. However, I think this article does you know certain things that we do need to maybe look at. And we talk about the drug gangs and some of the issues that some of the youth might fall into. I don't think we can, you know, rest the foot off the pedal as such, if that's a correct term. Because I do feel that a place like Brillington, if it doesn't have that investment or that a level of community that we really want to try and build now, it can be taken advantage of if we... That's, that's where I look at it. And, but, um, OK, so let's start with Alex. You've not spoken for a while. You have your closing sentiments on what you think to this discussion or say nothing at all, whatever you like. Well, no, it's just an important discussion we need to be having and working out what we can do from, from our level. Because mm. like, I think a lot of the problems come from a lot higher up, but there's still what we need to work out, what elements we can work on from here. Rather than rely, it, yeah, it? we can't just rely on like, hand-me-downs constantly when we do have like, the community full of talent already Absolutely. that can start making changes that will be positive. And so long as it's just like 
optimistic but not ignoring like any of the other issues mm. um, that do exist, then that's just going to be a positive movement. So just got to keep it up, I guess. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Cheers for coming. Um, I think it's been really interesting to hear everybody's viewpoints on it and to, to meet people that I've not met before as well. Um, it's really about where do we take it from here? What, what do we do with this conversation that we've had? Where, where do you want to take it? Um, I, well, I think it's interesting that you're going to talk to this, the UCA group yeah. and, and, and see what could come of that. But I also think that if you're interested in doing something at Spotlight, maybe, then, you know, it's a conversation that yeah. you can have. I mean, Manda does a lot of the admin for Spotlight, so she's a really good person to speak to. So if there's any sort of connections people have picked up on, then we just follow them through with each other. Absolutely. No, um, totally. If everyone, I mean, I'm happy to give my contact details to the group to stay cool. in touch if that's what people want to do. Would you do this again, be part of a panel like this? Has everyone been kind of okay with, I mean, I know I need more microphones. I'll do that. <laughs> I think I'd like to say a big thank you to the voluntary groups that already exist around. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, says you <laughs> give so much time, and you know there are other groups as well, plenty of them. Uh, and it is that community that will rebuild the town, but it needs so much help, and it needs it to be the priority of the people who hold the purse strings. That's, that's my closing statement make sure it's a priority there mm. and we can make some real headway. I'm not interested in how much they've spent over the years because they'll tell me relentlessly, we're still in the bottom 10% nationally. That, why would anybody be content with that? We mustn't be. I think so. that's a very good point. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy about tonight. Uh, I think everybody's had a real good chance to say their piece um, and listen to everybody else. Um, I hope that we have meetings like this again uh, because we're all people who are uh, quite passionate about the town and it's getting that uh, movement going of doing something positive and bringing people together uh, and making a difference. I've already said enough, fight the power. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just thank you for inviting me tonight. It's been really nice to hear everyone's thoughts and be able to talk myself. And um, I just want to say that from moving from West Yorkshire five years ago, I wouldn't want to move back. I like living in Bridlington, even though it has problems, but you know, everywhere has problems. So you just got to make the best of it. And uh, on a positive note, I didn't mention before, but on Hildethorpe Road, we are getting those new shops being built, which will hopefully bring lots of new jobs for people. Mm. So that is a, a good thing. Did, you, did I get that you do the admin at Spotlight? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, I might have to talk to you because I need admin, just okay. to anyone who does admin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I'm being employed. <laughs> anyone who does admin. Um, Cheers. Nice one. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so I'll just say one more thing, just on the point of that, I want to thank, like you say, there's some fantastic volunteer groups. I mean, Spotlight Theatre is another one. Uh, Irvas, if people haven't heard of Irvas, I keep on talking about Irvas because they're, they're, that's all their thing is doing funded applications and help you through those things. Um, and of course, I'd like to apologise to Kay Wardle at the skate park. She's done amazing work there. And I know some of the things in the article have really kind of misconstrued what it is like down there. I've been down, I don't know if anyone else has been down there when all the kids are there. They're amazing, they're like, did some of sorts, I had no idea they were that good. Um, and the graffiti on there, I, I think that was definitely taken out of context because I was there with the chap and what I was saying was like, this graffiti had faded, we need the artist back to do it again, that kind of thing. I don't know what the whole association with graffiti being bad, I don't know, I love graffiti, I mean, look at all these stencil things. <laughs> um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, so, Apologies for people who may have thought it was an attack on the town. I'm all about the town, and I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard now Andy Walker's about the town. We're all, we are here about the town, and uh, hopefully we'll do more of these panels. So if you do see this, if you have any ideas what you want to talk about, maybe you want to get on here yourself, reach out. We're going to hopefully build upon this, aren't we, Johnson? We're going to get some more content. And, get good. and anyone here as well want to talk about things, or want to set up a, like a podcast or a show or a debate, let's do it. Let's uh, work together. It's all about positivity, isn't it? So. Let's do it, guys. That's a wrap.
<laughs> How was that, Jason? Is that okay? Yeah.